Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to be moderating uh, the session on the future of conservation offsets. There are a number of acts across Canada, as we all know, that provide enabling legislation to implement payment or offset programs for the provision of ecosystem services. And this is really exciting, given that we have heard about the struggles that we have finding balance in the environmental, um, in, in environmental output on a working landscape with this um, increasing population. And so at the Canadian Cattlemen's Association, we are what I would call cautiously optimistic about the future of conservation offsets to ensure that we can retain the vi uh, viability of the prairie landscape and, you know, the cowboy. <laughs> However, although we're optimistic, we're also slightly concerned about the creation of new competitors for land only being compensated for change and the potential for the addition of more regulatory burden. And we must be cognizant of what is good for our entire industry. Luckily, we have a panel of individuals with us today to offer insight on the opportunities and challenges on province-wide conservation offset systems. And I would like to introduce at this time Dave Poulton. Dave is currently a graduate student at the Natural Resources, Energy and Environment Program at the University of Calgary Faculty of Law and Environmental Strategies Consultant. He is currently organizing the Alberta Association for Conservation Offsets as a forum to advance understanding and consensus respecting the use of conservation offsets. Dave is president of the Board of Directors of the Environmental Law Centre in Edmonton, Alberta. So to kick off, Dave is going to give us a presentation. Um, I would also like to introduce at this time our other two panelists. We have Andy Edburn. Andy's a biologist by training. Andy, maybe give us a wave. <laughs> and the Director of Environment for AltaLink, a transmission company who owns and operates over 12,000 kilometers of power lines. In this role, Andy and his, his team provide environmental support to all new um, build transmission projects and day-to-day -day operations. Over the past several years, Andy has been active in the planning and development of conservation offsetting programs in the province and is involved in the Southeast Conservation Offset Program in many areas of Alberta. And Karen Raven, um, is uh, Karen is an agricultural land use specialist with the Environmental Stewardship Division of Alberta Agriculture and Rural Development based in Edmonton. Uh, she co-leads the Southeast Alberta Conservation Offset Pilot and provides input to provincial land use policy and multi-stakeholder group initiatives re relating to conservation and stewardship. And so to kick off this session this afternoon, Dave, as I mentioned, or this morning is going to present some of the background to conservation offsets in Alberta. We will then have three questions that we are going to ask each of the panelists, and then we will move into questions from the audience. So please join me in welcoming uh, Dave Poulton and the other panelists. Thanks, Vaughn. Um, I neither have a joke nor a hockey story, so I will uh, just move right into this. So my, uh, my task this morning is just to give you a bit of a foundational overview of what conservation offsets are, some of the variations on the concept, and what the state of policy development is in Alberta in a, in a very brief way. So the, the terminology here can get a little bit uh, confusing. It seems that every jurisdiction that considers offsets uh, feels the need to give it a different name, and part of the, the challenge in working in this area is to keep up to date with the, the new terminology that comes out. So conservation offsets is actually a made in Alberta term. Uh, more commonly internationally, the term is used biodiversity offsets, habitat compensation, habitat replacement, compensatory mitigation is the American term. Conservation allowances is a new term that came from Environment Canada a couple of years ago because they hadn't put out a new term for a while, I guess. Um, so, um, yeah, it just it, as uh, you may hear people or documents using these different terms, they are essentially synonymous. In some cases, there's subtle variations between them. But they essentially refer to the same thing. And here, here is the uh, sort of internationally accepted definition. It's measurable conservation outcomes. So the emphasis is on outcomes. Uh, resulting from actions designed to compensate for significant residual adverse biodiversity impacts arising from project development after appropriate prevention and mitigation measures have been taken. Um, this comes from the Business and Biodiversity Offset Program, which is an international collaboration of 80 companies, government agencies, financial institutions, and environmental organizations, um, affectionately known to its friends as BBOP. So the real essence of this program is that there is a, a linking of opportunities to develop the land for uh, economic 
opportunities with an obligation to enhance or maintain the natural values of other pieces of land with a view to the two um, balancing each other out and reaching a ne neutral effect on biodiversity, or in some cases a positive effect. And this is uh, depicted on this graph, um, which uh, depicts uh, what is called the, the mitigation hierarchy. Um, this was uh, shown yesterday, and I think some of this ground has been fairly heavily trod in the last uh, day or so. So I'll, I'll try and keep it brief. Uh, essentially what uh, this was projects um, moving from the left side of the screen to the right. Um, basic development of the long brown uh, graph going down on the left is sort of old-fashioned, irresponsible development without consideration of, uh, of environment at all, where um, now this is development as it might have been done in, say, you know, 1850. Um, the, the next step in environmental responsibility is avoided impact through the proper siting and, and design of projects. We can avoid uh, sensitive ecosystems and help protect uh, some of the um, most important ecological characteristics. The next step is mitigation, uh, which is all the measures that can be built into a, a project in order to lessen its, its environmental impact. And essentially at that point is where our conventional environmental assessment and management programs tend to end. What uh, offsetting brings is another tool that adds on to that. It's not, not a supplement, it's an add-on. Um, which uh, then requires that the developer undertake some positive ecological measure on another site, the offset site, um, which will result in that neutral impact, no net loss, or progress towards some other well-defined uh, landscape objective. And then the final uh, um, bar is that uh, once this project is underway, it's all, of course always possible to go that extra mile and actually produce a net positive impact. The, uh, the drivers behind this uh, are primarily, um, if it, uh, <laughs> no, there's three of them. Um, one is voluntary. Some companies are willing to do this on a voluntary basis. Andy will be talking a little bit about his, uh, his work with Altalink in that perspective. There's several other companies in Alberta that have undertaken to voluntarily uh, offset their, their impacts. Because there is no policy framework, a lot of those voluntary measures are they're ad hoc and, uh, and there's no common system of measurement around them, but there's been some very good experiences. Uh, permits conditioned by regulators. Our regulators are starting to embrace the concept of, uh, of offsets uh, quite, quite fervently, particularly the federal regulators. The National Energy Board has imposed offset conditions on several major pipeline projects recently. Um, including most, uh, most prominently the Northern Gateway Pipeline where the NEB put uh, 10 conditions requiring four different types of, of conservation offsets. And then uh, I guess the, the real focus of our, uh, of our conversation today is the possibility of a, of a general application of, uh, of offset obligations by law or policy. Um, the three different ways that offsets can be supplied, uh, project specific, also called permitted responsible or bespoke, where the uh, project developer um, takes on the obligation itself to develop the offset and uh, essentially there's a very close linking then of the impact project and the, uh, the offset project. Banking, which we heard a good description of yesterday um, from Greg. Um, Craig, sorry, um, it involves the proactive development of positive measures on the land, and then the, the accumulation of credits, which can later then be applied to development projects, either by the banker itself or, or, uh, or transferred to others, uh, usually through a commercial sale. And then fees in lieu, which is essentially where uh, a developer is required to pay into a fund, which is then later used for uh, environmentally beneficial projects, again, with a view of, of achieving a, a neutral or positive outcome. Um, there's a lot of international experience in this area. Where the, while the conversation is still fairly new in Alberta, um, there, there have been active programs worldwide uh, in, in many jurisdictions. Uh, from a 2011 report, and I, I think these figures are now out of date because there's been a lot of movement in this area in the last couple of years, um, but at that point they counted 45 offset programs worldwide and 27 more under development. Um, in particular, uh, the, uh, the Americans with the wetland banking system, uh, the Australians have undertaken a lot of work in, in with respect to different um, environmental components. 
the Europeans, the, uh, Great Britain has just introduced a, a white paper for a new offset system. There's a great deal of international experience and thinking in this area, and so there's a lot that we can draw on. I don't think any of those um, systems are perfect, nor would any of the people involved in them claim that, but there's a lot of lessons that have been learned that we can draw from. Um, there's also uh, a lot of uh, support from international institutions. So the Convention on Biological Diversity, the parties have met several times and endorsed the idea of offsetting or research into the viability of offsetting. Um, in the financial world, the International Financial Corporation, which is a, a, a collaborative effort among many major uh, major banks and, and financial institutions has set standards uh, relating to offsetting for its work, uh, for projects which, which its members finance. And in a similar note, the equator principles are a, a, a set of financing uh, principles which banks, including um, all of the Canadian big banks, have signed on to, and it requires a no net loss sort of approach to uh, projects on the landscape. Federally, uh, there's a lot of experience under the Fisheries Act with offsetting for fish habitat. That's recently undergone uh, some statutory amendments, courtesy of Bill C-38, the omnibus bill a couple of years ago, and uh, DFO is in the process of revamping its policies. How much the change, substantial change, uh, results from that it remains to be seen. It may be a matter of, uh, of uh, more smoke and mirrors than substantial change, but we'll uh, we'll see. There's, there, um, but but there again, there's a lot of experience to draw on. There is a federal wetlands policy that requires no net loss approach to wetlands on federal land or federal projects. Species at Risk Act um, provides that offsetting may be undertaken for habitat for species at risk. Uh, that that particular provision has not been widely used and it's still a bit exploratory about how it applies, but um, it's, uh, it's there. And Environment Canada, and this is where they coined the term uh, conservation allowances, um, published this policy document in 2012 which uh, um, endorsed the concept and, and um, recommended increased use by federal regulators and authorities of, uh, of the offset notion. And this is what I referred earlier to, uh, to the regulators embracing this notion. Um, this is a, a history of the recent decisions uh, in the area. Uh, most prominent, we have the uh, Northern Gateway conditions, and also Shell Jack Pine um, provincially was a major driver as the Joint Review Panel there made some very strong statements about the importance of, of offsetting as a tool where there is uh, irremediable, irremediable impact um, from uh, the oil sands mine that was, pr pr um, that was proposed there. And as to where we are in Al Alberta, we've had a good discussion about the Alberta wetland policy um, that is strongly offset based. Um, the, the genesis for a lot of this policy discussion comes from the Alberta land use framework that was published in 2008. Um, thank you, Ted. And, uh, and arising from that, the Land Stewardship Act contains specific provisions enabling the development of regulations uh, for a, an offset regime and, in fact, a market in offset credits. Um, it's very flexible language in there and, and can be adapted to, uh, to um, many different designs uh, of systems that might work. We've also got several policy documents that refer to the potentially beneficial effect of an offset system. Um, and as, as Karen will be speaking about, we've got a pilot project um, underway for the last couple of years in southeast Alberta with respect to uh, native grassland. So there's a lot of um, policy interest in this. What we have not yet reached is that threshold of having a policy commitment and a clear um, uh, offset framework in place, but we think we're getting there. The, the, uh, there's a lot of issues attached to conservation offsetting. Um, some of these are universal design issues that come up in any offset system. Some of them are more specific to Alberta. I won't uh, get into talking about each one of them because um, we're, we're going to have a, a good opportunity to talk about them. But just a couple that, uh, that I'd like to highlight. One is that uh, the, the top one that any offset system requires a very clear objective with uh, a measurable objective that you can assess your progress towards or your progress away from. Um, so you need clear metrics and a clear objective and I think those are um, things that Alberta is struggling with. 
Um, and then the third point uh, is more, more particular to Alberta. 60% uh, of Alberta's land is public land. Interestingly enough, in the land use framework document, it actually refers to offsets as a tool on public land, not, not on private land. Um, but we don't have the legal tools for using offsets on public land. And that uh, is a substantial barrier, that, particularly when you consider the, the number of uh, highly impactful activities that are going on on public land. So I, I won't get into uh, all these other issues. I will just simply um, refer you to some resources. And, uh, and then we can move on to our discussion. Um, the document on the left is actually a, a thing that I authored a couple of, and was published a couple of months ago. I, uh, I didn't want to promote it, but Vic told me I should, so I'll, greet, I'll grab the opportunity. Um, it, it's, a, as it's called, a, a primer for Canada on biodiversity offsets and kind of reviews a lot of what I've talked about and some other fundamentals, looks at the experience of the Alberta or of the U.S. wetlands system and uh, also the, uh, the Australian state of Victoria and their work in, in offsetting for native vegetation. The, on the right is the website for uh, BBOP, the Business and Biodiversity Offset Program. It is um, filled with, with really great information on experiences around the world as well as a lot of the science and, and economic theory behind offsets. Um, some of it is a bit heavy, heavy going, but, uh, but it's a really invaluable resource for anybody interested in this area. So uh, if you're interested in wading in more into this, there, there's a couple of things that you can look at. And with that, I will wrap up my comments. Um, I think the other panel members asked me to leave up um, the initial graphic, so I will do that. And uh, thank you for your time. Thanks, Dave. We'll head right into the questions. So, um, based on your experiences, what opportunities are there for conservation offsets in Alberta? Um, what are the biggest challenges to implement implementation of conservation offset programs in Alberta? And Karen, let's start with you. Terrific. Thank you, Fawn. Well, we did uh, meet as a panel yesterday, and we realized that uh, within the time frame, we would have to keep it to just a, a few highlights for each of the questions. And for opportunities in Alberta, I do think there are some real opportunities. A lot of it is the how and the why. Again, as, as Dave mentioned, that clear outcome, what are we trying to achieve and how you do it. And what we've found through the pro process of our pilot is collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. That is just really key. We've got a very busy landscape out there. We're blessed with a lot of resources. Um, the opportunities um, to extract resources as well are private landowners. There's a lot of private lands who I see those folks as key to the provision of offsets and ability to um, additional suite of beneficial management practices or a complementary land use change like we have um, proposed within our offset pilot conversion of marginal cropland to native perennial species for sustainable grazing. So we see there are some real opportunities that are complementary to what industry is doing in addition to their avoidance and on-site mitigation and then the opportunity for the private landowners to be to be part of this as well and as far as the challenges and again i, I will just take a, a little bit of time because it will come through it with some of the rest of the questions um, Within government, we have many ministries, we have many departments within ministries, we have policy, we have operational, and yes, we do talk, um, but there's a lot of folks that uh, administer different pieces of legislation and look after different components, so we have to ensure that we're talking across ministries, across disciplines, um, with the non-governmental organization community, with the industry. If we don't have uh, potential purchases of offsets, then that's going to be problematic if you're asking the folks who are providing those offsets and engaging with private landowners. What we've been key to do and one of the challenges as, as we've gone through that is maintaining that constant collaboration and communication. That's uh, just really been integral. And what is the mechanism that is creating the scarcity or also to the mechanism to get people to the plate to purchase offsets to are is there going to be credit for early adoption otherwise how does Andy go to his CEO and say well we got this great idea and project we're going to do offsets and you know by the way it's going to cost a hundred thousand dollars so having having that very clearly in there as well that will help create certainty for the private landowners if they're going to be providing those offsets what are those 
clear signals to them. And I think maybe on a larger perspective, with something that's this complex, and there's a bit of trepidation for trying new things, looking at how are we gonna eat the elephant, and then deciding where that first bite is gonna come from. I think that's also where pilot projects are really important because they can help. Um, you can learn what works and what doesn't, and then the implications of taking that forward. I think that's really helpful, and that's what we're hoping to do with a pilot. We've had some extremely, as Todd and others can attest, we had some really raucous multi um pilot team meetings. We've got folks from all representation. But you really get at the heart of the issues, and it helps take um, some of that trepidation out there because you're talking about those hard questions. How are we going to address the key things with metrics? Um, issues of scale, that's a huge thing. How do you seed a plant community and then have measure those outcomes in a way, yet not be mired in really um, high transaction costs. You know, you want to have people have a very clear process to be able to uh, participate. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, first of all, I'd just like to thank Vic from the Alberta Land Institute for uh, inviting me here and also to Vaughn for moderating. So, I come at this from a slightly different perspective. So, I work for industry, I'm an environmental professional with, at Altalink. And despite all the good news, presentations, everything that's going on in the U.S. and elsewhere, from the presenters yesterday and today, there's still no formalized conservation offset framework in Alberta. That's sad. We are missing a golden opportunity here to do something good for this province. A lot of this stuff that we've been talking about in terms of offsets, call it what you will, it's been voluntary, a lot of it's been industry driven, and there's been a lack of a formalized process. Um, that said, if we can get a formalized process, does it have to be perfect? No. Pilots are great. We heard that loud and clear from the other presenters. Let's just try it out. Let's pull the trigger on a few of these things and get it going. I remember in the initial meetings with Karen, I think we had, I don't know, 50 of us in the room, and uh, we spent three, probably three hour sessions each just debating metrics and what is a disturbance and going back and forth and trying to quantify that. But at the end of the day, you see a person like Dave here, who's a researcher, an academic, a lawyer, um, we've got Karen with government, we've got myself. And our goal at the end of the day is to have a net improvement. And as long as we focus on that, we can get something done here to realize that. The other thing that I want to mention is, this may sound as a surprise, it may come as a surprise to some of you, there's no incentive for industry in Alberta to participate in an offset framework. And you may be shaking your head and go, why wouldn't you do that? Um, it's your social license to operate. Well, yeah, it is. And we do a lot of avoidance and mitigation and stewardship techniques and one thing that industry craves is certainty. Industry craves schedule. And we need to build our projects that are in the public need um, from a cost competitive basis. And that all said, we are doing a lot of things in this space already. And industry, I know I'm not speaking um, alone on this, would like to be recognized in that in the development of conservation offset frameworks moving forward. Dave, did you have anything to add in? Yeah, just um, I'd like to speak about a, a very specific opportunity that I think um, lends itself well to a pilot. Um, there's a major concern in many parts of the province with the density of linear disturbance. And it's mentioned in uh, Grizzly Bear Recovery Plan, the Caribou Recovery Plan, and it can be traced uh, to having significant impacts on several other sensitive species. And it's something that uh, has um, somewhat um, uh, our, our policymakers just haven't found a way to grapple with it. And it strikes me as one area where offsets could be um, designed in quite an easy way. Uh, there's a lot of this um, uh, sort of hand-wringing over metrics and objectives, um, and, and appropriately so in, in offset design. But with road density, we have a pretty clear set of objectives, for example, in the uh, Grizzly Bear Recovery Plan, it recommends, I believe, uh, road density. You don't, don't have to get into the details on this, 0 0.6 kilometers per kilometer squared. Um, but it's a, a measurable numerical target. And what can be easier to measure than the length of a road? I mean, we've been doing that since Egyptian times, right? So, you know, that's something that with a lot of these um, sort of technical issues evaporate, and it could make a really substantial difference on the landscape. Um, so I would just um, urge that when we're thinking about pilots and how to get our feet wet in this, that's one where we can 
we can start early and skip over a lot of the tough questions because they're, they're really easy in that case and, and make a, a substantial difference on the landscape. Could I just add to that, Vaughn? As part of our Southeast Alberta Conservation Offset Pilot, that's what we've looked at and what a lot of those discussions were about. And we came to a consensus, because you have to be able to measure it as well, just like you said, Dave. So we looked at disposition size. And even though um, industry indicated many of them do not um, impact the full extent of their disposition, um, that is something that we can quantify. As well, we looked at road, so the, at roads as well. So that would also factor into the quantification, looking at the effect of disturbance to soils, vegetation, and multi-species. So we took it back to that particular piece for the exact reason. That's something you can consistently measure, and at least for testing. Great, thank you. So moving on to the next question, what are the key elements of a framework for conservation offsets? What are the stumbling blocks in the creation and implementation of conservation offset programs? And Andy, let's start with you. Sure, so I will haggle over metrics. Um, <laughs> and he does. <laughs> and I do. That's what I bring to this, not only from a, a biology perspective, but from an industry perspective. So when we were meeting yesterday, uh, David mentioned, hey, this should be so easy. You know, you guys do linear disturbances, and you told me you're doing 2,000 kilometers of new lines. So at three to one, you should restore 6,000 kilometers. Ha, ha, ha. And I went, Dave, um, no, let's think about this here. So not to call you out, Dave, or anything like that. But, uh, 6,000 kilometers of restoration from a financial perspective, does that make sense to the ratepayers of Alberta? Probably not. Um, where we avoid and mitigate our impacts through tower siting, through avoiding wetlands, through wildlife management plans, through the avoidance of historic resources, native prairie, the list goes on and on. Um, should that be accounted for? Yeah, I think so. Where we have something that we cannot mitigate, we've got something where we've tried everything, every tool in the toolbox, to me that's an offset something we can't mitigate. So in working with, with Dave and Karen, I think we're kind of getting towards that delta uh, as we work through the Southeast Conservation Offset Pilot and others. So I think that's pretty important to note. The other thing um, in terms of key elements, the metrics are important, but we have to remember that we can't price people out of the party here. If, if the, the buy-in price is too much for offsets, industry's gonna walk away. And that's a no net win. That's a new NNW. How do you guys like that? Acronym? <laughs> um, for industry, because if, if some players can't compete, we're regulated. Altalink is, as other transmission companies are in Alberta. Some private companies may be able to play in that space. We may not be able to. And if we're losing that opportunity, um, then we're losing the conservation benefit with that as well. Uh, so to me, and I heard this a lot yesterday, the metrics, the offsets have to be fair and flexible. And I was chatting with some of my colleagues, Ducks Unlimited, this morning. And things we kept coming back to was flexible and adaptable. And Tracy, in his talk yesterday, I, I want to reference him, he said, you know, be aware of what you're building, okay? Make sure you have the tools in place to get the job done, but be careful of the outcome, and that kind of resonated with me. We've got a lot of tools in place here. What works for Caribou up north doesn't work in southern Alberta, it may not. So we've got two distinctly different things. If we're adaptable and flexible, we can come to some kind of uh, solution here. As for the stumbling blocks, <laughs> uh, you know what, unfortunately there's a lot. Um, like I said, offsets have been voluntary in Alberta. You know what, we've got these pilots here, like I said, let's try them out. 80-20 rule is good, I think, in this space. Um, we're not going to get a perfect pilot. We'll, Karen and I and Dave and the others will be sitting around the room for another five years trying to figure this out. Let's go with what we have. We heard from some of the speakers this morning that yeah, pilots may, be, may not be successful. That's mm -hmm. fine. Learn from it and move on to the next one. So I think that's pretty key. In my line of business and in, in industry in Alberta, holy man, shareholders, stakeholders that are out there, they've got a lot of input and it's gotta be fair and it's gotta make sense. You gotta be speaking their language. If it's ranchers, landowners, um, if it's government agencies, NGOs, a lot of the things that we're talking about has to be collaborative in nature. We have to get people's input. And people have to recognize there is a little bit of give and take here too and that the process isn't perfect, but if we have that net gain or net improvement as our goal at the end of the day, it's a win. Uh, other stumbling blocks, I, I think the biggest one is that it's not a one size fits all. To me, I really focus on if we can avoid, awesome. If we can mitigate, fantastic. If we can't, let's look at that delta and let's figure that out. And it's not a one size fits all. 
Um, Altalink, we've been, uh, in my opinion anyways, we've been stewards, we've been leaders in the space. We've donated to the University of Alberta for Fruginous Hawk recovery studies. We've donated to lots of different um, environmental organizations. We've been working with Ducks Unlimited, Alberta Conservation Association. Uh, we've done whatever we can to streamline processes, um, give our help to government agencies, ESRD, in terms of research and environmental protection plans. Some companies are better than others at this. And at the end of the day, to me, that all rolls into um, conservation and a conservation offset. And I would just add to to what Andy said. We've got we've got a lot of common th common themes, um, key elements in the stakeholder engagement um, landscape context. I think in Alberta, we're not just starting from a blank slate. We're we're working from a landscape that's highly fragmented, a lot of multiple uses. So, how do you ensure you get the most conservation benefit, and also that landowners are going to be are going to be recognized for that, and. That mitigation hierarchy. What we've, when we've talked about the pilot to to others, they really want to see that 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 is followed. So that's key to the framework, the landscape context, stakeholder engagement, and I think back and forth. Um, we've learned so much through the pilot, and I think having a mechanism where that is continuous, that we can continue to gain. That we've got some of our best ideas by talking to landowners, by talking to industry, and just having those really good raucous arguments at at the pilot team level. So we've learned a different opinion is not a bad thing. In fact, it makes us better. So I think the ability to keep that going and keep the collaboration, um, that, is, that is essential. Um, and with the, the stumbling box, you know, even when you get to the policy point, how do you operationalize that? We've tried to think that through within the pilot because with having multi-stakeholder at our pilot team, People are very good at finding out what may be some of the unintended consequences or what may not work and how we can address that. So how do you operate policy? Again, one size doesn't fit all in the grasslands. There's different drivers and pressures within each region. There's also a different suite of practices and uh, land use changes that are going to be compatible that landowners will be willing to provide depending on where you are in the province. So having a set of principles that can be applied province-wide, but also there is that flexibility on the regional or local level as to how that's going to be delivered and how um, having the local involvement. And we're still friends. <laughs> <laughs> so the last question before we get to the audience question um, is, questions is, um, what do you think will be the biggest challenge in ramping up from an offset pilot project um, that you've been involved with to a provincial system? Karen, would you like to start? Well, it kind of just um, continues on from what I talked in the, in the previous question, um, keeping that provincial scope but reflecting regional differences, the different ecosystems and what the different drivers are. In the southeast of Alberta, you've got the 80% of the species at risk. You've got the largest proportion of uh, native dry mixed grass prairie. So that's going to be very different than if you go in, in, into the boreal system. So how do, how do you work that in a way that can um, be applied and what we also looked at within our pilot was lowering transaction costs. You don't want to have, and I know this is government saying this, a 15 step process in order to achieve part A or part B. So how do you be an idealist but have a very healthy dose of pragmatism to go in with that? Um, there's a lot of different ideas um, with metrics and there's a lot of relevance to all of them but they may operate best at different scales. So how do you integrate all the different scientific knowledge that's out there in a way that we can measure, but we can also measure in a cost-effective way? Um, we've tried to look at tools that have been developed and untested in Alberta, and let's build on what we have versus building a new wheel. And we've got a lot of really good things um, through the various organizations in Alberta that are being developed the transaction costs, the reporting, and ensuring that quality outcome. How do, how do you measure it? Um, because really, offsets are a tool. We have to really keep the focus on what is the outcome we're trying to achieve, and how do we ensure that we are doing that in a fair way with industry, with landowners, and also so the public has confidence in what we're doing. And keeping uh, transparent, clear, science-based without um, really getting mired in the weeds as well. Yeah, I think for me, um, ramping up a pilot to a provincial system, I just want to take a step back. It was probably five or six months ago I had the opportunity to work for some work with some colleagues from some oil and gas companies. 
who are struggling in this space as I am, and we sat down at a round table and just brought up the different types of conservation offset <laughs> frameworks, plans, implementation, whatever you want to call it, that we're all working on. It was shocking, so guilty that I have been running with some voluntary programs to try to get projects approved, mainly. Uh, my friends in oil and gas and forestry even have been doing the same thing. Uh, so we need a coordinated approach, right? Going off, running out and doing these things has a ripple effect to other industry. It has a ripple effect for other stakeholders. It sets precedent. If you can tell, I've been hanging around with lawyers a little bit too much. <laughs> but uh, it really does. So I think, I really think that we need to get coordinated and in a provincial system with a pilot, uh, I think there's an opportunity to learn um, based on the work that Karen's doing on the Southeast pilot. Also, let's get our friends, um, Torsten talked yesterday about the wetland policy. Let's see how that shapes out. I think there's a really good opportunity there in the conservation offset space. Uh, the regional plans in the province, there's provisions in the South Saskatchewan regional, pan, regional plan to um, start implementing conservation offsets. Um, there's a lot of moving parts here. Uh, I'm not one for committees, but hey, let's get some of these key folks together twice a year and work through it and learn from each other. We can't be doing this in isolation. There's just too much at stake. And uh, the big build, if you want to call that an oil and gas transmission, industrial development in Alberta is slowly moving. Um, it's going to come to an end. It's going to slow down. And the time is now, guys. We've got to be engaged. We've got to be working together. Dave, any final comments? I can't stop that. So, so. <laughs> Alrighty, well, we'll turn it over to the audience now for any questions to our panelists. One over here. Yep. Hello, Jason Unger with the Environmental Law Center. Um, I guess one of my concerns, one of many, is how do you maintain a robust regulatory framework around the avoidance provisions of, of a mitigation hierarchy when there's often a tendency, we've seen it with wetlands, to jump to compensation? Um, that is to say, how do we avoid um, offsets becoming or perceived a panacea to social and environmental licenses? I'll take that one. That's a, that's a great question. Uh, this is something that we've discussed, my peers, um, colleagues at Altalink. You know what, it would be so easy to jump into a offset. It would be. You could site a tower in a wetland, you could do whatever, um, and just pay for it. That's not a good social license to operate from an environmental perspective. I think one thing that we've learned through um, the Water Act and in our dealings with ESRD is they're focused on avoidance and so are we. If we can avoid and demonstrate that avoidance, guess what? We're not waiting anywhere from three to six months for a permit, for an approval. We can get out and we can construct our projects quicker. Also, we, we're not involved in a permanent loss or permanent disturbance to a wetland, for example. So I think just framing that up and making sure that avoidance is still key in any regulatory approval and just demonstrating that where you couldn't avoid, that's okay too. You've, you've demonstrated you can minimize, you can mitigate, and at the end of the day, if offsetting is what it is, you've gone through that hierarchy and you've demonstrated that. So I think that's pretty key. I guess I would just say that it's definitely a legitimate concern, Jason, and something that we, uh, we really have to keep an eye on. It, it, uh, all we can do is make it clear in our, in our policies and in our, our legislation that that's what's expected. But these categories of avoidance and, and mitigation and, uh, and are not, um, they're not cast in stone. There, there's some fuzzy, fuzziness around the concept, and there's some significant cost differentials too. So, we, I think we, you know, while I'm fully in favor of the mitigation hierarchy, if avoiding an impact is immensely more costly than offsetting it, is that really the best use of those resources? If we could offset in abundance, um, and and achieve a positive environmental income to, or, um, outcome. Do we, uh, do we really want to um, invest those resources then in, in avoiding the original impact? Uh, so it's a, it, it's a good set of principles that I think we should embrace, but it is somewhat fluid and, and context dependent. So uh, we have to have a, a little bit of uh, 
flexibility around it, as, as the others have said. And within the pilot to address that issue of avoidance, because that did can't come up about how, what is the baseline? How do you show that? Some of the tools we like to test are, for example, where we've had factors for the grassland vegetation inventory for depending on what site you're on. If you're on a loamy site, um, that's a far easier to reclaim. So there, that is, um, and then the, on the sites, for example, that are blowouts, those are extremely difficult to restore. So there's a much higher factor. So it's essentially, encouraging avoidance, and if you're citing in areas that are more easily to be reclaimed, that's how you'd show that there is, and within using the multi-species conservation value, there's rankings for where the habitat is of highest um, quality. Um, there's a lower factor for areas that are more disturbed and not as pristine or beneficial for multi-species. So that's something we'd like to test just to see how, how can, is this, and again, how, how would you measure that? But we've tried to build that piece in that it's going to encourage people to go where they're more likely to have success and reduce their impacts. Excuse me. Hi, Peter Doby. I'm the farmer's advocate. And in Alberta, we have a model now, the carbon offset uh, model. And it's, it's based on really having large emitters as the buyers of offsets. Uh, I think for simplicity, you know, it's sort of a model. So my question is, uh, what model or does, the, does that concept translate to the conservation ops, offset model or what would you see as sort of the entity that would handle the management of the ins and outs? So would the carbon offset model work for conservation offsets? Thanks. Yes, well, I think it's certainly the province's intention to use the, uh, the specified emitters model um, at, 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 as at least a starting point for the, for the development of the conservation offset framework. Um, I think there's a couple of important distinctions. I, first, I don't um, I don't dislike that model, and I think there's, there's a lot of value in learning from it and, and uh, adopting elements of it. But um, first of all, biodiversity and the, uh, the landscape characteristics that we're talking about here are extremely diverse. There's no common uh, metric it's com comparable to a, a ton of CO2 equivalent. Um, and it's also very site-specific, that uh, components cannot be easily exchanged. Uh, the other thing is, as you pointed out, the specified emitters regulation, and in fact in the name, is it only applies to the large emitters. And a lot of our landscape impacts are a result of cumulative effect of multiple small decisions. And so I think we need a, a system which encompasses uh, much smaller, both large and small scale. Um, perhaps not in the same way though, perhaps we need to have some simplified system where uh, a, a small project with a small capital uh, base can can easily buy into buying credits uh, on a on an over-the-counter basis, and and leave the uh, the more complex projects to the to the larger projects. Well, we did look um, since, of course, Alberta Agriculture has been heavily involved with uh, some of the provision of the offsets of the agriculture side of the carbon. We did do a lessons learned as, as well as part of that, but then. In because of the where our pilot is in that specific area, we also want it to ensure for exactly the reasons Dave said, you know, to have that ability um, that we're going to be operating on a smaller scale. So in our consultations um, with industry and landowners, people were very comfortable that let's stick with the dry mixed grass within the south the southeast portion of Alberta. We would take Industry would look at compiling all their imp potential impacts on projects for a year within that dry mixed grass, and then that would be pooled. We're utilizing and testing a third party, which in our case is Alberta Conservation Association, because they have that ability to um, seed to native perennials. In this case, they have the financial capability and as well the, the uh, staff with the uh, agrologists and biologists that can help deliver that. So that's why we looked at that particular approach to address that. So you're getting those pooled impacts for year and others, and there's still, again, there's going to be flexibility with that when we're going through to the testing. Taking that third party who can help pool that, go out and help, then we put out our expression of interest to landowners for the, for the amount of offsets. So it simplifies it, it localizes it, but you're still um, keeping the integrity of the system, but getting folks um, right down to creating those offsets on the ground. 
Next question. Aron Kaplinsky, U of A. Um, I know something about the theory of conservation offsets, but very little about the practice. So I have a question first about the impact site. Can I assume that it's a condition for approval of the development that the benefits of the development will outweigh the environmental costs? I'm, I'm assuming that if that's not the case, the development never gets approved. Is that right? That's, that's the presumption, I guess. Great. Yeah. So Whether it's the me, reality yeah. is, is uh, okay. open to okay, debate. Good. So now let me ask you about the offset site. Is, is it also a, a condition of the offset site that the cost of mitigation be lower than the benefits of mitigation? That is that we create a net benefit from the mitigation. For, from the offset? That, that's what you're asking? Well, there's an offset site on yes. which there's mitigation. The okay. mitigation has a cost and it yep. creates a benefit. Right. Yes, so the, the, it, the benefit there is to outweigh the cost as well, yes. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Although the benefit, you know, there, there may be different metrics, and one may be an economic benefit, the, the other one will be a, an ecological benefit. And these are two distinct benefits, ecological and economic benefits. Well, they flow together in this yes. arena, as you know, and, and how to, um, how to delineate them, if you want to delineate them, and maybe we don't, is, uh, is a bit of a challenge. Well, I think we have to have a good notion of what is a benefit and what is a cost if we're going to undertake this. Hard to, hard to uh, argue with that. Thanks. Well, and it's certainly come up at, at, um, within uh, the development of our pilot because um, if you're doing a practice change or a conversion of land use, you don't want to inadvertently trigger, um, let's say the cost for conversion to native perennials is more, and the, and the ongoing management is more expensive than just going and buying some native prairie. So you want to be very careful about unintended consequences because that has larger impacts to the landowner community. So it's something we've been very careful to look at and it'll be interesting as we test to see, to see how that will actually work out. Thank you. Alrighty, we're having the battle of the lawyers up here, so next question. <laughs> Hi there, I have a two-part question. My name is Erin mcfarland Dyer, and I'm with the Alberta Lake Management Society. So um, you mentioned roads and seismic lines are an impact and that we could easily compensate for them. My uh, question is, those happen largely in public land, so the boreal forest and the foothills, whereas the offset program will, by necessity, occur on private land, which is the white area probably a completely different ecosystem. So I wanted to know from your opinion whether you think this is ethical, uh, especially from an ecological standpoint. Um, for lack of a better word, should we trash the boreal and protect the grasslands? Is, is it, is it going to be that trade-off that we have in Alberta? Um, and uh, the second question is, I'm, I'm assuming you've thought of this, and have you thought of buying up forestry leases or other government holdings to, or government sort of land? Things like that. Yes, uh, we did very definitely look at that as part of the pilot and again with landowners and industry because there is, a, it, it is easy for some folks, you know, potentially, you know, should we go in the north and go to the south, but it was a, a, a real consensus decision that impacts in the dry mixed grass prairies would be offset in the dry mixed grass prairies for just that exact same reason, the more local the better, but we also looked at um, prioritizing um, for the folks that participate in the provision of offsets, prioritizing where those offsets would occur for the most conservation benefit. So really looking at keeping it focused and not comparing apples, apples to oranges per se as much as we could. Because yes, that's a very important point. And I would also offer this. I don't think anybody in this room wants to trash anything, um, particularly trashing the boreal forest. But this is where I was going to my point about this has to be flexible and adaptable. So if we're doing some work in the white area or within a city boundary and the opportunity to restore something somewhere else comes up, that should be looked at, right? We talked about yesterday, some of the speakers, about not pigeonholing the um, conservation offset requirement just to a local geographic area. There's lots of areas that we can focus on in Alberta. We should keep that open. Um, concentrate on local first, but if there's an opportunity to move elsewhere, let's look at that. 
And I just want to clarify that I, by focusing on roads, I was, I was using that as a, as a mechanism that uh, I think might work quite well. Certainly the public lands issue is fundamental to that. I didn't mean to suggest that we were moving impacts from the boreal forest and the, the foothills into the, um, or I guess the impacts would grow there at, at, to the benefit of the grasslands. Um, but what it does highlight is this critical importance of developing a tool on public lands because, um, you know, particularly the oil, the oil sands impact, um, there's a real need to deal with that and uh, there's just not enough uh, land base out there to have, to develop the appropriate uh, offsets. Well, we're just about at the end. Um, Karen, I think you had a little bit of advertising to... <laughs> Thank you. We're all here with our... Well, it just uh, it takes a village to raise a child. It takes an even bigger village to raise an offset pilot. And we've had some really uh, great contributions. And we've uh, I've got our some of our documents from our offset pilot online because the whole point of doing the pilot is having ha having people to have the opportunity to look at it, to love it, hate it, pick it apart, give those that feedback back to us. Um, I, I'll be sharing some of these out. Our, our web page is going live, and that is agriculture.alberta forward slash, or .ca, pardon me, I have to take my glasses off, uh, with SEAB offset pilot. And that apparently it will not work on your iPhone. Uh, Tom has tested it, but it will work off your computer, and IT is on it. So we'll be posting more documents over the over the course of the next several months, and we just want and that's housed with Alberta Agriculture, um, out at the registration desk. Just an overview of the pilot, and as well the, one of the more recent documents um, that we've done with the Mastakis Institute, which is comparing of the. Um, Southeast Alberta Offset Pilot with generally agreed principles, and that stemmed out of a uh, workshop that was held in Calgary that was hosted by one of our pilot team members, Marion. And so we think there's some really good things that folks could potentially take away and just really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Great. Well, I think we had really great discussion, and please join me in thanking all of our panelists. <laughs>